Good morning, everyone. Buongiorno a tutti da Toronto. This uh, first part of the webinar will be in Italian uh, because we will be talking about uh, our endeavors to illustrate the opportunities in the sector. And uh, But of course, the second part will be uh, in English. Um, so I'm switching now, I'm begging for uh, the patience of our uh, English speaking friends. Um, di nuovo buongiorno a tutti, mi fa piacere di, di vedervi, è, è un gruppo che non è numerosissimo ma che comunque è sicuramente molto uh, mirato e interessato a questo, al tema che, che vedremo oggi. Um, io uh, sono il direttore del, del LICE in Canada, Marco Saladini, e eh, insieme a Paolo Benzi uh, vi do il benvenuto a questa occasione di, di approfondimento e anche di, uh, di scoperta di alcune opportunità uh, d'affari che uh, diciamo, ruotano intorno a alle tecnologie ambientali, in particolare per eh, le costruzioni eh, sostenibili e per la gestione delle acque. Paolo, eh, vai pure avanti, che eh, diamo uno sguardo veloce al contesto, diciamo, dove ci troviamo. Ci troviamo in un paese enorme, con tanto spazio anche per, eh, diciamo, portare eh, via, <ride> nascondere, diciamo, eh, i rifiuti, le... le, le e quello che appunto non, non si può riciclare immediatamente, e, eh, ma eh, che comunque ha le necessità perché eh, sta sviluppandosi in una maniera molto rapida, soprattutto intorno ai grandi centri urbani, ma anche in altre zone, quindi eh, ci, sono, ci sono delle necessità importanti. Non so se riusciamo a far vedere la prossima slide, Paolo. Ok, eccoci qua, infatti stiamo raccontando della, della superficie enorme del Canada, con un numero di abitanti inferiore a quello dell'Italia e un tasso di crescita molto rapido. Come vedete le province importanti, quelle che si conoscono, sono Ontario, Quebec e British Columbia, insieme ad Alberta, che è anche una zona che per altri versi ha bisogno di tecnologie ambientali perché c'è una forte presenza di industria, di industria minerale. Ok, andiamo avanti e... Um, um, Prossima slide, per favore, vediamo come eh, c'è stato comunque una, un forte legame eh, fra Italia e Canada anche dal punto di vista del commercio con l'estero e eh, naturalmente qui parliamo di prodotti, poi eh, noi invece faremo riferimento in, queste, in questo ora di cui staremo insieme anche molto a dei servizi che purtroppo non, non possiamo mappare con, questa, con la stessa precisione. Avanti ancora e eh, vediamo come eh, noi eh, possiamo, il eh, nostro, nostro piccolo, <ride> con gli organici che abbiamo, i, i mezzi che abbiamo, eh, Italian Trade Agency o ICE, come è conosciuto, o anche Italian Trade Commission, eh, eh, possiamo eh, supportare le imprese nel loro percorso di avvicinamento alle opportunità in Canada. Um, siamo qui in Canada, abbiamo la fortuna di avere tre punti di presenza, eh, uno in via di apertura a Van e altri due consolidati a Toronto e, e Montreal. Prego la prossima e eh, naturalmente facciamo parte di un network molto più ampio. Quello che possiamo fare diciamo, è eh, supportare le imprese nel loro marketing nei modi assolutamente più vari e più diversi, dalla ricerca di partner, di clienti, eh, fino all'organizzazione ehm, di eventi autonomi, eh, passando per la partecipazione a fiere eh, e, le, e tutta la parte informativa e eh, quando avrete la presentazione potrete vedere anche direttamente quali sono, le, eh, quali sono i servizi, quali non riconosciate, insomma, nel catalogo che appunto è, è cliccabile. Eh, andiamo avanti e eh, abbiamo comunque, ehm, diciamo, ehm, abbiamo riscoperto, perché dopo la pausa pandemica, insomma, si può, si può parlare di una riscoperta del, del settore ambientale, con la partecipazione a Ecomondo a novembre del 2022, in best editorale c'ero io che presentavo una ricerca che vedete anche qui eh, linkata e che eh, fa il punto eh, grazie alla, al lavoro di Echion, un consulente che abbiamo eh, ingaggiato per l'occasione eh, eh, sulla, sulla gestione dei rifiuti e poi eh, siamo andati a Americana portando alcune imprese a marzo 2023, una fiera eh, di, di una certa dimensione media a Montreal con, con un discreto, una discreta eh, una gamma di opportunità insomma, presenti lì e eh, progettiamo di andare a Globe Forum febbraio 24 
a Vancouver di tornare a PIDAC che è eh, esplorazione di minerali e miniere qui a Toronto a marzo del 2024 e forse, ma stiamo ancora valutando, andare a Canadian Waste and Recycling Export a settembre del 2024. Quindi con noi, venendo diciamo, insieme a noi a questi, a questi eventi, poi ci sarà la possibilità di sostenervi e di avere, eh, di avere una, una moltiplicazione diciamo, dei vostri contatti, delle opportunità di, di networking e di affari. Insomma, ecco. eh, mi sembra che siamo quasi giunti alla fine della mia parte. Qual è la prossima, Paolo? Ok, e sì. quindi lascio la parola a Paolo Benzi, che l'ha detto al nostro osservatorio Gare Appalti di Montreal. Prego. Grazie, dottor Marco Saladini da Toronto. Eh, buongiorno a tutti. Eh, opero presso l'ICE Montreal eh, per l'osservatorio Gare Appalti, che è una funzione riattivata lo scorso anno dopo il lancio del 2018 ed è un osservatorio nato in merito al contesto del CETA, l'accordo economico tra il Canada e l'Unione Europea. Eh, gli appalti pubblici in Canada hanno una prevalenza importante, leggermente superiore alla media delle OECD. Eh, comunque la frazione della partecipazione pubblica nelle spese di approvvigionamento sono superiore alla media, siamo all'87%. Quando in Italia siamo al 77. Eh, il CETA è appunto un accordo tra il Canada e l'Unione Europea introdotto e siglato nel 2017 e a cinque anni dell'anniversario diciamo, dell'accordo dell le relazioni economiche e commerciali tra i due continenti, quindi tra Canada e l'Unione Europea, si sono rafforzate e quindi questo accordo ha contribuito ad aumentare gli scambi economici tra i due paesi, in particolare stiamo parlando di Italia e Canada. Ovviamente l'accordo prevede le soglie di applicazione, eh, per quanto riguarda i beni eh, di consumo o i servizi siamo una soglia intorno ai 360 mila dollari, per la costruzione si parla di soglie di 9 milioni di dollari canadesi. Ci sono delle esclusioni, e su questo nella bibliografia del CETA ci sono dei dettagli maggiori che comunque riguardano la sicurezza e difesa nazionale, eh, assistenza internazionale, cooperazione e sviluppo e altre eccezioni come i trasporti, il materiale televisivo, acquisto di acqua e energia, eccetera. Gli appalti pubblici in Canada sono settorializzati in diversi indirizzi, tra cui oggi faremo un focus su una parte dell'edilizia e una parte del trattamento delle acque. Per darvi un flash delle energie rinnovabili in Canada, abbiamo una frazione enorme, i due terzi sono i, su base idroelettrica, quindi perfettamente rinnovabile, eh, un altro, un quarto eh, di biomassa solida e il terzo sono veramente produzioni molto minori. Quindi l'energia rinnovabile in Canada si base, si base essenzialmente sul settore idroelettrico e biomassa solida. I grandi progetti in Canada sono distribuiti su tutto il territorio, ovviamente per popolazione Ontario, Quebec e British Columbia eh, costituiscono la maggioranza delle, dei residenti. I progetti che prendiamo in carico oggi sono, abbiamo detto, nel campo della costruzione e del trattamento delle acque e costituiscono, come vediamo in questa proporzione, eh, il 14% della costruzione dei progetti pubblici e quasi il 7% per il trattamento delle acque. Questa è una tabella aggiornata dei primi maggiori progetti in campo di appalti pubblici in Canada, aggiornato alla primavera 2023, quindi vediamo che nei primi dieci classificati in importo, per importo di miliardi di dollari, abbiamo eh, l'energia in particolare e il transit, cioè il trasporto urbano. Eh, sulle acque c'è un grande progetto in British Columbia in, che importa circa, ha un importo di circa 10 miliardi di dollari, ma ci sono altri progetti minori che eh, seguono la lista dei primi 10. Che cosa fa l'osservatorio eh, gare appalti? Si occupa principalmente del monitoraggio delle gare d'appalto pubbliche in Canada, eh, di notizie di mercato, di opportunità e di anteprime di grandi progetti. Eh, quello che facciamo è eh, la pubblicazione di queste notizie, anteprime grandi progetti e segnalazioni di gare internazionali sul sito garappalti.ca, è un sito in italiano dedicato appunto alle comunicazioni dell'osservatorio verso le imprese italiane. Ovviamente le notizie vengono pubblicate anche sul sito dell'ICE.it, sulle notizie della rete e le gare e le anteprime di progetti vengono eh, rimbalzate su Extender, il sito italiano. Gli appalti pubblici in Canada sono pubblicati da 
canadabice.canada.ca che è il sito ufficiale del governo federale con la raccolta di eh, tutti gli appalti pubblici canadesi e da, dall'anno scorso hanno integrato anche gli appalti a livello provinciale e municipale. MERS.com è un database importante di riferimento che pubblica una buona parte di appalti pubblici. Abbiamo un database Tender Space di cui usufruiamo da circa un anno che raccoglie oltre 800 database di eh, gare di appalti eh, in Canada pubblici, federali, provinciali e municipali. E finalmente sul nostro sito possiamo proporre una newsletter al quale vi eh, invitiamo a registrarvi per poter ricevere appunto notizie periodiche nel settore dei, delle gare. I servizi per le aziende italiane, come abbiamo detto, sono il monitoraggio, modalità di partecipazione alle gare e, ed essendo noi su questo territorio possiamo vivere in prima persona alcuni dettagli importanti per le imprese italiane che volessero parteciparvi. Ora finalmente vi presento i relatori della webinar di oggi, eh, ne abbiamo quattro esperti nel settore del green building e del trattamento acque, quindi il focus è su questi due subsettori del clean tech. Eh, vi presento Black Jackson, che è il direttore della sustainability dell'azienda NORC eh, di architettura e ingegneria basata a Toronto. Eh, John Casola è, appartiene alla Canada Infrastructure Bank, è responsabile degli investimenti. Eh, Indra Marian è direttore dell'innovazione dell'Ontario Clean Water Agency, quindi esperto del trattamento delle acque. E finalmente Bob Paul da Vancouver è responsabile e primo consulente dell'azienda E5 Consulting Solution eh, da Vancouver, esperto in Clintech. Quindi vi troverete nella presentazione che vi faremo avere un breve profilo professionale dei quattro relatori. E finalmente passo la parola a Black per la prima parte dell'esposizione della, dell della presentazione. Prego Black, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Let me share my screen here. Oh, you'll have to stop sharing your screen and then I'll be able to, there we go, perfect. Thank you so much. No worries. All right, I believe we're ready to go. So um, thank you all. I think I followed all of the last presentation. Um, we'll see at the quiz at the end. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk a little bit about um, sort of my passion, which is uh, greening of the built environment. And when I was invited here to sort of talk about how do we create a uh, North American market for products made in Italy. I started to think about my own journey with Italian products. And, you know, I, I went back to when I was six years old and I had a, a Lamborghini poster on my wall. And I think that for better or for worse, that's what North Americans think of when they think of Italian products. They think of beauty, they think of luxury. And I like this image in particular because as a sustainability director, I find that we want beauty and luxury, but we want sustainability too. So my call to you is to provide us with that and the market will follow. So um, you had an introduction to me earlier. Again, my name is Blake Jackson. I'm an architect and director of sustainability with NOR Architecture and Engineering. I've got about 22, 23 years of experience in the industry and I've been working dedicated as a sustainability professional for about 17 of those years. Uh, NOR is a 840 person a uh, company that does architecture, engineering, planning, and interiors across 12 different sectors in North America, as well as in the UK and in the Emirates. And if you can think of a building uh, that you need, we can design and engineer it for you. And with that, we get to bring a lot of experience from various different markets, in particular our global markets, which are pushing sustainability a little bit harder than we are here in North America, but we're starting to play catch up. And when I try to explain what my role is as a sustainability director for a global company, it's really about change agency. So when I first got started in sustainability, it was more about research, conservation, energy efficiency, but it has, it has sprung into this other realm of resiliency and promoting health and well-being and social equity so that we and our clients can leverage their capital expenditures in order to meet their corporate social responsibility or CSR commitments as well as their environmental and social governance or ESG commitments. And so this role is really about change agency and we can do that through consumption. I, I truly, truly believe that. And um, as we're talking about consumers, um, the good news for 
a European market is that we no longer are experiencing uh, intense climate denialism in North America. I mean, you get pockets of resistance here and there, uh, but we seem to have awakened to the fact that the, uh, the climate crisis is upon us. We can't keep kicking the can down the road. And suddenly we're being asked to do this catch up, this playing this game of catch up very quickly. Um, and we're also being asked to do more work on shorter time periods with less resources and also less fees. So in order to accomplish the level of complexity, which is a sort of a carbon positive society, we need partnerships with various different vendors to help us get there. It's something I'm actually optimistic about talking to a European audience here today because probably you could educate me on many of the things that you're being required to do as opposed to their voluntary over here. And we also have the alignment with the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. And essentially for an architecture company, uh, we're very heavily focused on item number 11, which is sustainable cities and communities. Uh, manufacturers may be more focused on number 12, but essentially whatever our business is and whatever our clients' businesses are, um, we're trying to translate that into basically a, a hyper-focus on number 13, which is climate action. So every step that we take in our business is a, an opportunity for climate action. And likewise with those partners and vendors that we're working with. And also trying to, as an industry, uh, leverage number 17, which are partnerships greater than just the business units that we are to try to figure out bigger picture issues within the industry. And so when I talk about the industry in, in regard to product manufacturers, um, the biggest change that I've seen over the years is with regard to a promotion of transparency and also the uh, disclosure of various different ingredients within the chemistry of the products. And transparency is important because it makes us focus on the environmental impacts of a product from its moment of extraction, extraction of raw materials to transportation, manufacturing, packaging, all the way to the point of sale. So everything that we, uh, we and I say we as manufacturers, um, control along our supply chain. So not just looking at products as a moment in time, but really understanding the implications across the supply chain and then reporting that to consumers so they can make responsible decisions regarding various different products. The disclosure component on the right-hand side is more with regard to the chemistry and the impacts upon human health. And again, we're not trying to um, uh, demonize any industry or necessarily any chemistry. The idea is that by giving consumers the information, they will make appropriate choices themselves and they will send direct signals to the market. And this is something, again, we're playing catch up with in North America that in Europe uh, have had to deal with these types of constructs for a long time. So I want to share a couple of stories about this just to illustrate why this is important, because beyond the numbers, I think the, the stories are more important because the stories lead to change that becomes marketing, that becomes market share. Um, one of my favorite flooring products is a company called Forbo, and uh, they raw, uh, their, their source of raw materials is from the, the, the Midwest and the, and the plains in Canada. And it's a bio-based product. It's made from flaxseed husks and, and uh, flaxseed oil. And um, it, we use it in schools. We use it in science and technology facilities, healthcare. Um, it's a very durable and robust and green product. Um, they were early adopters to uh, environmental product declarations and transparency in general and wanted to get that market share early about a decade ago. So they started down this journey of doing an environmental product declaration, thinking that their main source of greenhouse gas emissions was going to be their transportation of the products once they were manufactured to a global market. What they actually found out was that it was uh, their biggest greenhouse gas em emissions activity was with regard to the harvesting of the flaxseed and then the burn off of the chaff at the end of the season. What happened was the burn off emitted a lot of carbon. It created a nitrogen over overload that was run off into streams and it caused environmental harm throughout various different ecosystems. And so what they did instead of burning off the chaff at the end of the season, they turned it into a feedstock because what do they also have in the Midwest and the Western Plains of Canada? They have lots of cattle. So they were able to feed the cattle a local feedstock that was much healthier than what they had been given. They turned this waste stream into uh, a revenue generator that solved an ecological problem and it also allowed the product to be reduced in its price point to the consumer. So this is a win-win-win or better put, 
not just collecting data on environmental parameters, but actually transforming it into, uh, into positive good for the consumers as well as for the company. And I'm, I'm not on the payroll, so I'm just telling you the stories that I like to talk about. Uh, another great example of disclosure is with regard to this building here in the center. So this is the Bullet Center in Seattle, Washington. It is a living building challenge certified project as of about, I don't know, six or seven years. It's been there for a little while. And the living building challenge is the most stringent uh, third party rating system in existence, far beyond LEED, far beyond BRIAM, um, or any other sort of used systems uh, in, the, in the matrix or the ecosystem of rating systems. Um, when they were looking at the exterior cladding system here, they found that there weren't any uh, cladding systems that would meet all the code requirements but that also and the budget points, but that also uh, avoided the chemicals of concern on their red list. So they went to the manufacturer, the, the design team, and they had a conversation with them about eliminating chemicals of concern that they wouldn't have been able to have had without the disclosure. And the impact that this project has had is that the manufacturer was able to eliminate those chemicals of concern from that individual product, from the whole line of products that they provided. And now any project, this one and others that specify this material, get the benefit of that disclosure. And so disclosure is really powerful whenever you leverage it for the potential that it has. It's not just about data, it's about figuring out ways uh, to send uh, signals to the market to really refine various different products. So as you can see, we're moving from the data collection point, which is our footprint, and just looking at how do we optimize various different products. And, and that goes from a, in a whole building down to the individual components that make it to this notion of handprinting. And the idea of handprinting is that um, it's the philosophy essentially that there can be good done through the profit generated by goods and services provided. And that's a very different conversation than just focusing on a, hand, a footprint, which is just reduce, reduce, reduce. It's about how do we transform this good intention into products that sell and tell good stories. One example of that is the uh, NetFX carpet by Interface Flooring. And what they realized is that they had a, a difficult time sourcing their raw materials because the raw materials were ending up as single stream waste in various different parts of the world. So through partnerships with various different locations, they were able to identify areas and uh, remote areas in the Philippine islands where they were having ecological challenges with net pollution and from fishing and overfishing. And what they did was pretty revolutionary. They paid a living wage to these workers in these villages to instead of overfishing these areas to collect the nets, to package them and then to send them to the US so they could be remanufactured as a raw material resource for this various different carpet. And in exchange, they were also, in addition to cleaning up their environment, but they were also paying a living wage to the workers there. So they were making a positive impact where they were located, a positive impact on the environment, and they were able to source raw materials that could become uh, part of their circularity story or their circular economy story. Um, other sort of disclosure items such as cradle to cradle certification, which you may be a little more familiar with. I, I like this one just because it um, doesn't reward you. For, it, it looks at holistic measures, so material health, reutilization or circularity, renewables, water stewardship and social fairness. I grew up in a manufacturing town, so I'm very focused on the social fairness piece of this and, and manufacturing is something that often gets lost. And what I like about cradle to cradle is it looks holistically at all these different measures it certifies products based on their worst score, not their best score. So it sends messages so that how manufacturers can continue to gain market share and also to tell their stories as well as disclose and provide environmental impacts as well. But it basically translates the data into action, which is what we like to see from manufacturers. And one other thing I think about in European products is that they tend to have this level of disclosure and environmental emphasis that other products typically don't. This is just a, a quick look at a summary of all these various different drivers for products. So I used to work at a company called Stantec, which is 29,000 people. It's also headquartered in Canada. And uh, we had offices all over the world. We had an office in Rome, uh, more stories about that later, but we created this document so that any office with an interior design uh, specialty could leverage this knowledge in order to help them make determinations on which products in our library made it into their specifications. A lot of this was driven by third-party certifications, which are very big in North America. 
And whether we pursue the certifications or not, uh, they still generally drive code, they drive compliance with government standards. Uh, it's a really good way to gain a leg up in market share, uh, regardless of the certification numbers, they're being used all the time. Um, now, what they try to do is they try to focus us on a series of different eco labels uh, to avoid greenwashing. So there are thousands of eco labels out there and a lot of it is just marketing. And so the, the trusted eco labels and the third party certification systems are the ones that we tend to focus on just to help us minimize the complexity. And, and as I said, there are thousands of these things. So um, we look specifically for this list right here and I'm happy to make the presentation uh, in the interest of time available to the audience if they want afterwards and can look at this in a little bit more detail. But as you can see, the list here, the benefits are generally myriad. So not just one, it's not just transparency or disclosure, but the better products have both plus something else. So we're always juggling the decision-making complexity because we have to make, meet availability, budget, schedule, fire code, durability, maintenance. And we generally don't specify proprietary products. Generally, we are looking for three to five equal alternatives. So it's not a given, even if you do all these wonderful things that it makes it into the, the projects, but it gives you a, at least a shot, at least a 20% chance, if not greater. And we've been able to do this with coffee. And uh, I think we can do it with building products and even buildings. The fact that if I'm drinking my coffee, I know that my money was spent making the world a better place. And I think we can have that same for the products. And so I hope that our next conversation with our team at NOR and you, when you come to visit or come to call upon us, it will be a conversation about transparency, disclosure, hand printing, et cetera. So with that, uh, I think I've stayed within the time. I don't know if we have questions directly after or we wait to the end, but I encourage you all to keep in touch and, and I wish you all the, the best of luck on creating that market chair uh, in Canada and across North America. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Blake, and uh, yeah, amazing presentation. So it's quite difficult to stay in 10 minutes and to give all the information, <laughs> but we share with everybody your contact, your full contact. So all the company connect and not connect, they will be able to reach you for any question. And uh, we try with this kind of webinar to improve the connection between Italian firms and uh, potential supplier and Canadian project. So thank you so much, Blake. And uh, John, anything good? Uh, yes, I'm just going to... Okay, John Casola from Canada Infrastructure Bank. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Buongiorno a tutti. Excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> That's um, not wine, you. eh? Yeah. Not wine. <laughs> uh, un po' presto. <laughs> for that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, Marco and Paolo. I had the privilege of, uh, of speaking at one of your early webinars where we just gave a high level overview of, uh, of what we're doing in the building retrofit space. I'm the chief investment officer at the Canada Infrastructure Bank. Uh, Canada Infrastructure Bank has, uh, was created by the federal government and seeded with $35 billion um, to invest in predefined sectors. I'll get to what those are in a minute, but the emphasis is, is um, very much on green and sustainable. And so, Blake, I loved your, your prep. We haven't met before, but I'm, I, I loved your presentation and your emphasis on, on sustainable because you'll see most of what we do. We have, uh, by the end of March, which is the end of our fiscal year, we, uh, we had closed about 45 financial transactions and committed uh, involving about $10 billion Canadian um, of CIB money and the vast majority of those projects is in is in green and clean. And so like Blake, um, you know, one of the things I, I like to talk about is what, what a privilege it is for me to be in this role because I have a personal view that there's too many people around the world talking about doing the right thing and not enough people actually doing anything about it. And, and I get the privilege of going to work every day and actually making a difference, putting money, our money, Canadians money, uh, where our mouth is and, and trying uh, to elicit change. So um, the second thing I want to say about Blake's presentation is uh, I'm, I, I have a, a slide uh, uh, inadequacy feelings now because mine's very 1990s compared to the brilliant slides you had. So um, 
anyway, I'll, I'll do the best with what I have in, in the time I'm allotted. Again, just a little bit more on, on the CIB value proposition. We are an impact investor. So that's what we focus on. Our, our mandate from the federal government is to make an impact and making an impact means reducing GHG emissions. It means uh, causing modal shift uh, and getting people uh, to take more energy efficient, uh, climate friendly modes of transportation. It means connecting underserved communities to uh, high speed broadband so they can participate in the modern economy and take advantage of healthcare and, and education and all of those things. So we are partner to governments, indigenous communities and private institutional um, investors. Uh, couple of things we that are really key to us. We, we don't make grants, so we only make investments, and that is we can play anywhere in the capital structure, so we can be equity in projects, and what, most of what we do is loans. Um, and we can we can be anywhere in the capital structure. As I say, we can be senior debt or, 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 or subordinated debt. The, the other really important piece is we cannot be in a project. We cannot invest in a project if it doesn't have an adequate amount of private sector capital alongside us. The whole impetus of the bank when it was created is that you know, neither the, the governments or the, the private sector can solve the challenges, the climate challenges that we have uh, in this country around infrastructure. Uh, and so together uh, we, we, we stand a fighting chance and it's our job to you know, eliminate just enough of the risk or fill the gaps that we see in, in really good positive projects to allow for private capital who have li are a much lower risk profile uh, uh, appetite than we do to, 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 to join us in, in the projects. Um, so I, I sit atop a team of about 55 investment professionals here. We're headquartered in Toronto, but we have two satellite offices, uh, one in Montreal. We have a team of about 10 people in Montreal and a team of about seven people in Calgary. Here are the priority sectors that we uh, uh, that we deal in, and and um, uh, you'll see public transit, five billion, clean power, to, and that means you know generation transmission. Uh, it means storage. We're involved in a lot of those things. And in, in clean power, we we have been heavily in lieu. Uh, one of the big projects that is in the news, and, and that our involvement in is is public is is trying to uh, uh, really solve the issue in Atlantic Canada. Um, around getting them off coal and generating greening their grids and generating clean power. That's a project called the Atlantic Loop. It involves bringing Quebec and New Brunswick and Nova Scotia together along with the federal government. And it is the uh, such an important project, but also the uh, poster child for herding cats, as we like to say here, which is uh, difficult to corral all the parties that have various interests, uh, their own quite legitimate interests, but trying to get them all on the same page to uh, to 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 achieve that very uh, important uh, end. Green infrastructure is 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 what we'll talk a little bit more today, and it involves, um, you know, big ticket uh, carbon capture we're, get, we're getting into and low carbon fuels uh, development, but also involves uh, our uh, energy efficiency, energy efficiency re retrofits program for buildings. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, which is key to today and water and wastewater infrastructure. Uh, and we, we also just launched and announced our first investment in zero emission vehicle charging. And, and so that, that's very exciting. And uh, also in trade and transportation at the end, you'll see uh, I, I, I jumped one because it, you, you know, we're trying to play up, up and down the supply chain line. So we're also getting involved in critical minerals in the mining of critical minerals to try and extract those minerals to feed the supply chain that produces the batteries that will allow for uh, charging. It's the, it is again, like the, the, the poster child for, you know, chicken and egg when it comes to that. And so we have the ability to be long-term patient capital, take the ramp up risk, wait to be repaid until utilization starts to go. You can't get that kind of structure, that kind of money in the private sector. So we play a really interesting role there. Um, the, the targets, I'll just say a word on the targets, uh, the, the 10 billion under clean power and the green, green infrastructure, 10 billion, those used to say $5 billion each until the federal budget in April, uh, which changed those to 10. Uh, uh, it, it, doesn't, it didn't really make a change. We were headed that way anyway, in terms of the projects that we were doing, but the, the federal government also announced that we are, uh, the Canada Infrastructure Bank is their primary tool for uh, really dealing with uh, uh, subsidizing, assisting with the buildout of clean clean power in this country. 
So what's our building retrofits initiative in, in, a, in a nutshell? It takes existing buildings and tries to clean them up. Uh, uh, buildings in this country, I'm not sure how, 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 how much they contribute to GHG emissions in, in, in Italy or the rest of, of Europe. In this country, depending on how you measure it, it's just slightly under 20%. The last number I saw was around 18. Uh, it is an enormous amount. And to put that into context, the oil sands in Canada, which is the single largest uh, emitter of, 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 of GHG emissions, is about 28%. So it is an enormous amount. Of, of, of emissions that we are trying to do our small part to uh, try and tame. And so um, we work with public sector and private sector, real estate owners and other market participants to try and modernize and, and improve building um, efficiency of, of existing buildings. Um, we provide, as you'll see in a minute, lower cost financing uh, and patient capital to uh, try to accelerate uh, work and uh, improvements on buildings to try and lower their uh, uh, footprints. So uh, the initiative summary is on the screen and I know Paolo will, will uh, distribute these slides afterwards. I won't go through every one of these things, but I think what's important to note just a couple of things is we need a minimum of $25 million CIB investment opportunity. Um, and uh, the other thing that's really important is uh, 30%, we need a minimum of 30% reduction in the GHG emissions for it to qualify. And one of the things we've done, which I, which I love about this program is that we have, we have structured our pricing on our debt to how deep the retrofit goes. So if you only achieve 30%, you get something like uh, Government of Canada bond rate plus 100 basis points. If you achieve 40%, you get money at Government of Canada rate. And if you achieve 50% 50 plus, you actually get Government of Canada minus 100, 100 basis points. So it's quite competitive and, and, and it also has a more favorable repayment profile as well. We're really trying to structure the loans to incentivize the greatest possible outcomes. Um, Actually, one more thing before we move on to a specific project. The way we're attacking the market, particularly in the private sector, is to lend to two different groups. One are building owners. So if there's a portfolio of buildings that they have, the REITs, the real estate investment trusts, uh, as we call them here in Canada, REITs, uh, are large property owners. And we've done a, you know, our, our, our key, our marquee deal with Dream REIT. Um, uh, we've done one now that's announced with Avenue Living. Um, uh, and so we... We, we, we provide facilities for those to do their buildings. The other way we're doing it is to encourage the use of aggregators in this country. And those are the market participants in green buildings like, uh, you know, the Johnson Controls of the World and Amoresco's. And, um, and there's, a, there's a one we've done in Quebec called Sofiac, which is a new uh, 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 energy services company, uh, which has investment from the, uh, the labor fund in Quebec and, and seeded by the government of Quebec as well. And what we do for those is we provide them a facility of say a hundred million dollars, and then they go out and actually get the clients that meet our criteria. So they're helping to do the work. And that allows us to do buildings that uh, are sub $25 million and kind of outsources the administration of that to those aggregators uh, and makes for a, a much more efficient deployment of our funds. Um, Paul asked me to talk about two specific deals which we've announced recently. Um, <clears throat> one is in the, in the building space and one is in the wet water wastewater space, which I'll talk about in a minute. <clears throat> the first one is in the building space, and it's called Noventa Energy Partners. We announced this deal just a couple of weeks ago. So as, as you'll see, for those of you who don't know, Noventa is a Toronto-based um, Toronto energy services renewable company. Uh, and it was founded by a gentleman named Dennis Fotinos. Dennis is the founder of and uh, CEO of N-Wave, which is a direct... Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking. Uh, <laughs> it provides underwater the deep lake cooling for um, uh, district energy is what I want to say. District energy, underwater cooling for, for, for buildings, highly efficient, highly uh, environmentally friendly. Uh, and started Lyft there to start, start this company with a uh, patented technology that comes originally from Germany. And what they did was they looked at the, the, the and, it, and it basically provides, uh, it takes energy from wastewater. So it taps into the wastewater 
uh, in big in big cities and actually uh, through their patented technology converts that to uh, uh, energy so it's used for heating and cooling. We, we did an actual deal with them which we had closed all, already with uh, Toronto Western Hospital uh, and they liked it so much and the, the experience was so good and so and that's under construction now that they came back to us and said we have several more clients uh, we'd like to talk to you about the uh, a facility where we could tap into your money. And so they, they did that. And we, we've we actually now closed on this facility, which is $100 million for Noventa. And they have come to us with a list of projects that they have signed uh, uh, memorandums of understanding on. Uh, and mostly those are in the uh, 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 public sector, what we call sometimes the mush sector here, municipalities, universities, schools, and hospitals. Um, and, and they include hospitals, universities, and other public spaces. Uh, but uh, that, is, that is a tremendous, tremendous uh, aggregate, aggregation vehicle that we're very proud of. And it, you'll, you'll see we're, we're, we're kind of uh, technology agnostic. Um, this is a proprietary technology that's different than district energy that might be different than, than some other types of retrofits. As long as it's proven and it works, we are less concerned about the how and more concerned about the what, as I like to say, and focus on achieving those um, energy savings. Uh, so that's Noventa. Um, I want to talk a little bit about wastewater. Uh, water, wastewater in this country is a huge need and we are frankly struggling with how to attack uh, that and tackle it in a meaningful way. Um, we one of the couple of the reasons for for it being a difficult nut to crack is that it, there are many small municipalities throughout this country and their capital needs are for much more modest size projects and we, we just don't have the capability to to do 20 million dollar projects across the country but even even more than that um, our requirement for private capital in these projects makes it quite difficult because many of these municipalities many of these water wastewater facilities are municipally owned and at least in this country and i'm, I'm not sure if it plays the same in in, in europe in this country there is a generally negative reaction for historical and other reasons to having a private sector run water assets or own water assets. It's uh, the whole privatization thing. And I'm, I'm not going to get into whether that's right or wrong. It just is. I think for anybody in the game, they, they need to recognize that that's, that's what we're dealing with. So we're working very hard right now behind the scenes to come up with structures, which we're quite close to, to rolling out, which we think addresses those two things, because it's not an area we can avoid. We can't just say, well, it's, it's challenging and it doesn't work, so we're, we're not going to do it. Um, we have to do it, and, and we must crack the nuts, so we're trying to be innovative and creative. One of the areas we have been able to do it in is in the Indigenous infrastructure space. That's one of our key focuses in this country. Indigenous reconciliation, Indigenous economic uh, empowerment is all really important. Um, so we're trying to, to do that. And, and so Grasswoods is a water, water wastewater treatment facility we've done. Um, it's in uh, northern Saskatchewan. We've also done another one called Port Stalashan in New Brunswick. And those provide water uh, wastewater services to Indigenous communities. The reason we were able to crack those nuts is because Indigenous equity counts as private equity. Uh, and uh, we also have different rules for Indigenous projects where instead of a general minimum threshold of about $100 million for Indigenous projects, it's down to about $5 million, recognizing that Indigenous communities are often small, remote, and it would be difficult to make an impact if, if, we, if we stuck to that. So I won't go over all of it. You'll have the slide in the interest of, in the interest of time. Um, I will leave it there, uh, hopefully a little bit of whetting your appetite about what we do and who we are. I would be uh, uh, very pleased to continue the conversation with anyone that wants to on these two topics or anything else that's in our remit. Um, and we are, the last thing I'll say is um, we are focused on building infrastructure in this country. And one of the things that this will matter to all of uh, your listeners today, we are, we do not have a mandate to favor Canadian companies or to favor Canadian technologies. Our goal is on the infrastructure. And so we welcome good ideas and positive impact from wherever it comes in the world. And we'll happy, be happy to work with you. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, John, for your contribution. 
very interesting, the two projects here in the retrofit and the wastewater. And uh, we try to support the Canada Infrastructure Bank in the connection with the Italian firms, potential supplier. Uh, then uh, is the turn of Indra. Indra, can you hear me? So I share your presentation. Thanks, Paolo, and uh, thanks, John, for ending with the water wastewater discussion. And and I I hundred percent agree with you. Uh, the the status of the condition of water wastewater infrastructure in Canada and and we work in Ontario, so I can speak for Ontario. There's a huge capital need to maintain this uh, infrastructure, and I'm going to cover in my slides some of those. Uh, and as we upgrade and expand this infrastructure, the need of innovative solutions is critical. And I think uh, a lot of attendees today will be interested in, in that, you know, because we look at similar to CIB, uh, Aqua Ontario Clean Water Agency, we are a crown corporation under Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. However, we don't get any funding from government. We operate on a cost recovery model. We have... Uh, uh, multi-year operating contracts with uh, almost 200 plus municipalities in Ontario. In Ontario, there's about 444 municipalities. Like uh, John said, that's why water wastewater system is very complex because a lot of them are owned by smaller municipalities uh, who doesn't have a capacity uh, to engage into uh, discussions beyond day-to-day uh, -day operations. So uh, we our operating authority by mandate from the government. And we have about 700 water wastewater systems. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna talk about how we have been driving, uh, you know, adoption of new innovative technologies through collaboration. And similar to what John said, we are very technology agnostic. Uh, we work with cross boundary, uh, provincial boundary and, and national boundaries to, to, you know, collaborate and bring in the new solutions uh, for the benefits of uh, rate pairs here. Next slide, Paul. So we are the largest water wastewater operator in Canada. However, because we are owned by the province, we only operate within the province of Ontario today. Uh, we have we serve about 4.5 million Ontarians and we manage about $20 billion of assets in municipal infrastructure. Uh, as you can see, we have a, a total of about 700 plus water wastewater facilities. We have some really large ones down here in Southern Ontario, like region of Peel, region of Waterloo. Uh, we have, uh, we operate most of the large water systems across Ontario, but we have also very, very small systems and, and including a 40 First Nations communities. Interestingly, we are also considered as an emergency backstop in case of any water emergency in this province by the mandate of the government. So what does that mean is there's, there's another 400 systems that we don't operate. And if there's any crisis around those systems, uh, we have a response team that get pulled into uh, to take over those systems, to support with those systems and whatnot. So we, we, are, we, we have a really unique business model for ourselves here. Next. Now, in terms of the innovation and collaboration, what we look at is, so we, we are about 1,100 uh, company, people company. And as you can anticipate, majority of our team are operations uh, scatter around Ontario. Now, if some of you uh, haven't sensed how big Ontario is, uh, Ontario is really huge. From Southern Ontario, where I work, um, our furthest facility is about uh, 28 hours drive. Uh, and then in Northern Ontario, between two facilities, you have to drive like three to four hours between one plant to another plant. So it's really big. So our people are all over the province and that's why there's a very much diverse between systems, uh, between the purchasing power of these systems, between the you know, treatment size and capacity of these systems. And that's why we have a huge range of solutions that we need. And, and, and hence we focus a lot on collaboration. We don't try to do it all ourselves. We work with our partners. Uh, you know, similar to CIB and other partners and, and make these projects happen. So our, our aim has been is how do we uh, look at these new solutions so that we can foster resiliency in these water wastewater systems. A uh, lot of our systems are old, built in 1970s. So as you can imagine, it's, uh, the technologies are outdated. Uh, and the assets, physical assets itself are kind of needing investment. So there's a huge investment 
Uh, I think there's about $6 billion price uh, that has been estimated by FCM and other uh, agencies uh, while uh, the need in water wastewater sector. So my group primarily focuses on how do we bring in these solutions? So my group is responsible for finding the solutions, see it, try it, do it, and then share it kind of model. So I borrowed this from the Lyft program down in uh, US, and we basically adopt this model, uh, you know, working with different partners uh, to, to, to figure out this cycle. Next. <clears throat> now, you know, to, strat to, to align our strategic directions, what we have been focusing is in these three uh, pillars. One is more around, I think Blake talked about uh, organics, biosolids and resource recovery. So we also have an initiative around that where we are in a mission to transform our water wastewater facilities into net zero energy facilities to start with, and then further down the road, net zero carbon. So what does that mean is we look at the technologies that helps us not just to treat uh, our water or wastewater, but also to recover the resources that is within these systems. So primarily energy, obviously, uh, uh, then heat, uh, then, then phosphorus, nitrogen, you know, all those, uh, you know, resources. And then uh, we also uh, have, a, you know, as you know, wastewater produces biosolids. So traditionally biosolids has been going to landfill. And in last five years, we have uh, started to move away from, from that. Biosolids can be converted into fertilizer, should be converted into fertilizer, and there's a huge opportunity of resource recovery. So we are focusing on a lot of technologies around uh, helping, uh, you know, enhance the biosolids from uh, liquid biosolids to more cake, more pelletizer, or more fertilizer kind of. And as I mentioned, a lot of our wastewater systems are very small. So a lot of them are lagoons, right? And lagoons are not non-mechanical systems. So it's a big pond where you just put the effluent for many number of weeks and you discharge. But however, a lot of these municipalities are growing, especially along the corridor of East-West Highway 401, it's, it's growing. And a lot of these systems can't handle the growth. And as you know, if you don't have a water wastewater capacity, you can't permit the growth. So we are in a very crux of the moment where our provincial government uh, is, is addressing the huge need of growth in this province. However, the water wastewater systems are becoming a huge barrier to, to achieve those growth. So these all municipalities are looking on a quick way how to increase this capacity. So since last two years, we have been focusing on intensification solutions. What does that mean is, yeah, you can go and build a mechanical plant, but it's gonna take five, seven years. And John, to John's point, it's gonna also cost $35 million to build. So what are you gonna do for that five, seven years? Is there any technologies that I can put in an existing infrastructure at a cost of a $1 million, $2 million that can be done in six, seven, eight months and give me you know, 10%, 20%, 30% treatment capacity? So we are not trying to expand the infrastructure per se, but we are looking at the solutions. And you know, we have a list of about 20 different projects where we are looking at different solutions which can work and a lot of times when we do these projects, we want to do it as a pay for performance model. Because a lot of these, uh, John alluded to that, a lot of these small municipalities doesn't have a capital. So they are willing to collaborate. They have some capital, not all. So, and then there's also, uh, you know, a little bit of concern about is this technology going to work? So how do we address the barrier, right? As a solution provider, we identify the barriers, we want to address it. So I usually, uh, you know, want to work with pay for performance and we have multiple projects where we are doing a pay for performance model where everybody is sharing the risks, everybody is sharing the reward. And once everything is worked, then, you know, we all recover the money, we all achieve our objectives. So we are focusing on lagoon infrastructures. Out of those uh, 700 systems, we have about 89 lagoons and, and those are the key business opportunities down the road. Now, the other uh, pillar we look at is innovation and strategic partnerships, where we support technology providers to demonstrate their technological performance in this province by working with the technology providers, by helping you go through the regulatory process, by helping you find the host systems, and then leading to a commercial deployment. Now, again, the disclaimer here is because we are a crown corporation, we don't support you in your business development, neither the sales activity, but we will help you prove your technology here in a, in, a, in a system that needs your solution. 
and, and our belief is that if there's a real problem and your solution solves that problem, you know, it should create a pathway to a full scale adoption. We also work with a lot of academic partners uh, to support on uh, emerging issues, you know, whether it's R&D, whether it's uh, again, validation of technological solutions, or even working with the regulatory where the regulations should be headed kind of thing. So we have a lot of projects that we work around, around that topic. Now, the biggest other uh, initiative we have currently ongoing, which is in a mature stage, is energy and greenhouse gas services. We do a lot of energy efficiency projects. We, in, in just, just in the last five years, we have already completed more than 300 projects, totaling a value of almost $50 million. Obviously, to John's point, these are really small projects. So, you know, it, it's really hassle. A lot of work goes into this, but the, but the impact is huge. And we also currently have about seven, uh, we call it co-digestion projects, where we are trying to bring in food organics into the anaerobic digester wastewater plant so that we can increase the biogas production, converting into either electricity, renewable natural gas, compressed natural gas, and certain like that. We call it energy recovery projects. So each of these projects are about 30 to $40 million. And then uh, we have about seven projects in different stages of development. One is starting construction soon. Uh, and, and then we also support a lot of these municipalities on reporting strategic plans and all these developments, because we believe that, you know, we sh these all uh, municipalities should focus on program approach, not project approach, right? So it should be a goal of achieving certain goals and then projects will fit under that. While we do all of these, as, as we said, uh, a lot of these small medium municipality doesn't have financial tools. So one of the largest activity my, my team does is supporting with funding. We explore, we canvas, we work with a lot of funders across the country. Even, even we have even worked with uh, international uh, funding agencies. Like we recently did a project with Dutch government. We got the Dutch funding to actually bring in a Dutch technology in Ontario, build a pilot unit and demonstrate the pilot unit. And then now there's a couple of uh, huge interest in that technology in Ontario. So, you know, we have done that, you know, wherever the funding is available, we'll work with that. And then, you know, in the last four years, we were able to secure almost $40 million funding, uh, which is a combination of loan and grants to, to uh, you know, uh, uh, initiate these multiple projects. Next. <clears throat> so these are, these are just some examples of demonstration projects we have done, as you can see, uh, you know, there's a lot of solutions available. So based on the problem we have, or the need of the systems. We have uh, <clears throat> divided these solutions into data analytics and sensors, uh, you know, emerging issues like phosphorus, nitrous, and ammonia removals, disruptive treatment technologies, which enhances that intensification usually. Uh, and then we have lagoons focus. So, you know, if you have solutions within these four uh, uh, compartments, let, let us know. Uh, we will we'll talk with you, we'll explore op opportunities with you. But if you don't have within these and different ones, let us know either. So as you can see, we have done some amazing works and I'm proud of my team and my organization. So under the disruptive te treatment technology, <clears throat> we were able to do a second North American installation uh, in one of, uh, one of the plants uh, with the MABR technology. And because we, we started this project, now there's a three more projects happening. Uh, the Ifira digester project is the one that I was mentioning about the DOTS technology. Uh, you know, we have other projects that we did in, in lagoons where we did uh, performance-based projects. So uh, yeah, so this is just a list. Again, there's a lot other elaborate list and uh, you can also find a lot of information about what we do in our website uh, in annual report, uh, Aqua's annual report. Next. <clears throat> Yeah, last is that we always explore partnerships and collaboration. As I said, we are very open. Uh, we are very, I am personally very interested to share what's here. Uh, you, I'm, I'm, I try to be accessible as much as I can uh, and uh, let's chat and let's explore. Thank you. Thank you, Indra, for your precious contribution. And uh, uh, of course, um, we have uh, Bob Paul from Vancouver. And uh, I repeat, all the content about the panelists will be shared just after the webinar. So, Bob. 
Okay, thank you, Paolo. Just um, made you share. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right. So thank you for inviting me to speak and great presentations from the panelists. And hopefully uh, there's going to be some overlap, some um, things that I, I have in my presentation that have been touched on. So I'll try to go through so we have a lot of time for uh, discussion and dialogue. So there's a bit of an overview I'm going to uh, cover. Um, I won't go through it. You can have a quick look and we'll get right into it here. Just an overview of Canada, and this is uh, obviously our 10 provinces and three territories. Most of the population is along the 49th parallel um, from Victoria all the way out to, to Eastern Canada. Uh, Toronto's a little bit below the 49th parallel, but that's where most of Canada's population resides and where the opportunity for the built environment is in wastewater and buildings uh, for the webinar today. So just this story of world emissions, this is sort of to give you an idea of um, our, our um, emission profile around the world where we need to tackle um, our carbon emissions in uh, all kinds of sectors uh, from transportation to, to buildings and wastewater, you name it. And this is just to give you a, a high level uh, image and breaking it down a little bit. This is where we see uh, sectors of where CO2 needs to be tackled. And in buildings, it's about uh, you know 13% of the equation. Um, landfills and wastewater treatment plants for, uh, in municipal areas is, um, is embedded likely in heavy industry. It's not profiled separately here, but uh, um, I don't have a percentage, but uh, there's a, uh, an opportunity there to tackle that uh, carbon drawdown. So why are we in this game? Well, this is a graphic to show you our nine planetary boundaries, and you can see in this graphic where um, the, the boundaries are being compromised in the um, yellow to, to orange range. So um, particularly I want to focus on um, the linkage here where we're seeing biochemical releases into the environment, nitrogen, phosphorus uh, relating to wastewater, uh, which we need to do a better job in um, trying to do resource recovery of nutrients and not let them release into the environment to cause um, uh, environmental problems. This is Canada's uh, image of uh, their focus areas globally, but also they're relevant internally into Canada. And I think uh, the policy is there around environment and climate change. Um, we talked about partnerships, but you know, there's the business to business partnerships, but there's also the government to government partnerships. So Italian trade agency and government of Canada, those kind of partnerships need to be explored further. How do we uh, increase investments to, help with uh, the environment and climate change. So the, the innovation ecosystem is there. We, we have that from startups all the way to commercialization, but there are challenges along the way um, uh, that need to be navigated, but we do have that pathway there now. And investments are being made. So venture capital and all the way to, to government funding to support. So you can see the priorities showing waste management and water treatment. So that's wastewater is in there, as, as well as energy efficiency links to buildings and renewable energy is mentioned, which crosses um, both of those areas. This is the um, Canada European Trade Agreement. It's not fully ratified, but you know it started off back in September uh, of 2017. Uh, and we are following the spirit of the agreement to um, look at collaborations. And I think the opportunity there is to let local governments know that this agreement exists. And this was an opportunity for innovation and investment from outside Canada to come in in buildings and uh, wastewater to make these kind of investments. So there's some more work to be done there, in my view, to enhance the, the spirit of this agreement. And Canada Infrastructure Bank priorities. Um, uh, this is just their five, and you can see um, uh, green infrastructure, energy efficient buildings is there, retrofits, wastewater treatment, and water is in there, and and to mention renewable energy. So this this is where we see the the overlap and and uh, from different agencies connecting in onto climate and environment priorities. It's just a snapshot of uh, treatment uh, in Canada. 
Um, there is a lot of opportunity um, uh, with our wastewater treatment facility because they are old and need to be upgraded and optimized and integration of new technologies. Um, so uh, this have a, you can have a look at this in more detail after. Here's the regulations is under the, the Fisheries Act, but the three key parts of the regulation is uh, effluent um, quality standards, effluent monitoring and reporting and record keeping. Record keeping uh, uh, um, and, and monitoring and reporting are key areas, I believe, for IT to get involved in, 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 in meeting compliance standards. Um, so there's a huge opportunity to integrate that aspect uh, into wastewater. So the supply chain opportunities in wastewater obviously can range all the way from toilet to treatment. So suppliers that provide um, fixtures in our homes and all the way in between to the infrastructure, right to treatment, there's a whole wide spectrum and that's why it's billions and billions of dollars. I wanna highlight this and I'm not sure if everyone knows this, but uh, Metro Vancouver has this uh, innovation center, the Annis Island Research Center. Uh, with federal government funding and provincial government funding in BC. And this is a place to do advanced innovation with wastewater. You can tap into different uh, supply lines from the treatment process and play around, whether it's dealing with biosolids or trying to do um, work with uh, nutrient water recovery um, for, for fertilizers or even using nutrient water to get into really advanced things like uh, growing microalgae through fermentation and then pathways that go, that go beyond to fuels and products from there. So uh, relating to housing, this is um, a huge area. We, we need to fill it. And I just want to uh, point out the opportunity uh, in housing is not only to upgrade current uh, housing infrastructure, but to supply more uh, rapid housing um, for, for the, the need across the country. And modular is the key thing. So for the architectural world to design modular, we're seeing a lot of interest um, from uh, outside coming into Canada with modularity. And uh, I think this is the, the place to, to be in for uh, helping solve the, the housing um, uh, issues in Canada. We also have a supply chain uh, issue with uh, not only materials, but in the labor force uh, from basically building basic homes. Um, this, this is just give you a snapshot. So we have an opportunity uh, to, to fix uh, these things as well as the supply chain of, of material inputs uh, in our homes um, all the way to, to, to furniture. Um, and in, in both areas, uh, the opportunity to improve housing and wastewater, as I mentioned, is, um, is modularity, uh, energy efficiency, net zero, all this stuff that's been touched up um, in wastewater, I just want to say optimization for me is, is huge. Integrated resource recovery and, and solving the problem in remote communities with more infrastructure for wastewater. I think we need to look at small scale modulized systems that can solve uh, some of these problems. There are some funding programs um, uh, that we have in Canada. Um, Invest Canada also has additional programs, so you can have a look at that. Um, as far as news, um, I uh, look at Renew Canada. This is a, a website that announces projects in wastewater and, and buildings and other infrastructure. So if you're curious about what's going on, this is a great place to get information. And about E5 solutions, well, uh, Paolo asked me, well, well, what did the five E's mean? Well, uh, in, the East are basically, I look at integrated systems and um, to try to do my thinking that way. So the E's are environment economy and then bridge with lots of education and in the corporate side of things, um, the other E's relate to uh, efficiency and effectiveness. So when we tie this all together, we have essentially a complete picture of, of, of doing things. And for, for me, um, I'm here to help as a consultant, um, a strong environmental background from government and uh, developing you know, product integration into the marketplace, partnerships, um, helping with procurement, um, conceptualizing projects. And if you need uh, funding assistance, uh, can look at that too. And that's me and uh, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back to Paolo. Thank you, Bob. Everything good. Thank you for your presentation. So 
Um, finally, uh, we complete this webinar with the four panelists, and uh, we wish to thank everybody, Bob, John, Indra, and Blake, uh, for their contribution. So we are proud to collaborate with you and uh, maybe to develop more opportunities in the next future, especially for the Italian potential supplier. So thank you, everybody. I leave the last word to Mr. Saladini from Toronto. Marco? Sure. Um, yeah. What a fantastic team that we, we gathered today. I mean, I'm really, I'm really pleased and excited for the developments that we can create, uh, provided that um, our Italian um, companies and solution providers uh, um, come and uh, engage and uh, we're ready to support them. So thanks again. I don't want to drag it too long. We went 15 minutes longer than we expected, but I think it was really worth it. Uh, have a great day and please let's keep in touch on both sides. Thank you. Thank you to everybody and stay tuned from Italy and uh, visit our garapalti.ca to find out uh, this presentation and the uh, recording of this webinar. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.